Hello and welcome to another Draft House Diary for Thursday, May 25th, 2023, when my boy Ian and I here went to Alamo Draft House Sloan's Lake to see Fast 10, the 10th Fast and Furious movie, or the 11th if you count Hobbs and Shaw, which I kind of do, but that's a different conversation. I think they counted it based on the way they included <laughs> things. And of course, I had to join this one because the Fast and Furious franchise is about family. <laughs> This is a franchise that, I don't know, I for some reason I care deeply about this franchise. I like cars. I like racing movies. Speed Racer is one of my favorite movies of all time. Again, another conversation. Amazing. Had to see this. Fast and Furious, it's become, it's not, it's, it's not movies. It's become my wisdom tradition. There's more to it than that. But that said, I still feel like this franchise has gone on too long. Oh, absolutely. Fast and Furious is very much like having a tabletop group because you started out with one story, probably something out of the book, felt normal, and you ran a normal story with low-powered characters, but they did a thing. At this point, everyone is so high-powered, it's ridiculous, and you're showing up just because it's fun to hang out with everybody and talk about the ridiculous things <laughs> and whether or not you're actually succeeding in whatever the plot was kind of becomes secondary. <laughs> and I stayed on board as this franchise got more ridiculous when they replaced physics with Dwayne Johnson in episode five. Fine. I was cool with that, but when they revived Han, well, it was weird, but more Han is always good. So more Han go is always that. good. And yet, I, I really think that they should have ended this with, with Seven. Yeah. I, I loved Seven, and it ended with that great tribute to Paul Walker. May he rest in peace. And it, starting with Eight is when they just got... They got more ridiculous. It, it wasn't just escalating action, escalating capabilities of Dom and his family and their cars. The plots themselves just became more and more ridiculous. And as they became more ridiculous, they came, became less relatable. Yeah. I might never in a million years steal DVD players to pay for my sister's uh, medical school. It, it would be a shock to my sister, for one thing. <laughs> but at least you could relate to the people and the motivations in episode one. And even two and three. I like three more than a lot of people do. Three's good. And... And so on. But with eight, they just, they became bad James Bond movies. I disagree with the adding of the word bad. <laughs> okay. I think they became weird James Bond movies. Yeah. There, there is absolutely, and it is because they are suddenly agents working with a government organization, pulling off ridiculous things. This is absolutely the James Bond equivalent, but this is the... This is the James Bond equivalent that does a backyard barbecue instead <laughs> of doing, uh, you know, martinis and fancy uh, dinners in Paris. It is absolutely the same kind of setup, but with a different s seasoning. Yeah, they they I have to give them that they they still maintained the characters. The characters, I think, stayed true to who they were early on. They but just put them into these increasingly ridiculous scenarios this wasn't dom toretto is suddenly james bond it's no it's dom toretto in a james bond plot which which was fun for a while i was on board for most of eight but in retrospect really seven was where they should have ended yeah but in t and i i'm gonna say fast 10 is an absolute beautiful collision of a movie it is but the more I think about it, the less I feel angry at it. <laughs> I and I'm terrified of that fact. I know what you mean. I can't, as much as I have a problem with where this franchise has gone, given how much I care about it, I can't not like Fast and Furious 10. And there's, there's two reasons for me, and I yeah. want to know if they're the same. One, Fast and Furious 10 acknowledges how wild Fast and Furious has gotten. Because you've got the, the agency turning on our people, and they've got this entire sequence of talking about how this team has gotten more and more impressive over time, and kind of 
it, kind of doing a summary. It's it's wild. We're there yeah. at the Alamo, and I'm like, I've seen this clip. This was in the pre-roll. <laughs> Alamo made it themselves. Why is it in the film? But it's there, yeah. and it kind of fits. And it's a, it's a fine example of what TV tropes would call lampshading. Instead of hiding something, you put on you put a lampshade over it, and then pretend it's not there. <laughs> and so the wild ridiculousness is just like. That's a lamp now. We're moving on. <laughs> and it's perfect. <laughs> You're right. That one scene pretty much saves the movie for me because they have this agent briefing another agent. And he explains how they went from steal from, from highway hijacking, i.e. stealing DVD players on L.A. freeways in, uh, in the first movie. They graduated to drug running, which is involved in the later movies, though they weren't really running drugs, of course, because they're good guys. And of course. They're family. And they graduate to, to prison breaks. Yes. To you know, running hot cars and all of these things, one after another. And it makes it seem almost plausible that this little criminal gang in L.A. <laughs> could escalate to greater and greater crimes of greater and greater international scope. And... They throw in that their specialty is corrupting law enforcement. Yes, that's so they, the best they line. talk about corrupting O'Connor as the an example of how they can corrupt law enforcement and get them on their side. Same thing with people in the agency and Mister Nobody. He gets he, they, they they come under the spell of Dom Toretto and his family. It makes it plausible, or at least makes it plausible enough within the context of this story that it kind of saves it for me. Yes. The other thing that saves this movie completely is Jason Momoa. He he makes he's it's occasionally cringy, but well worth watching, and he makes every scene he's in a lot more fun. Jason Momoa giddy stepping <laughs> down a cat down like metal catwalks in a in a, like a building site in order to go over to the thing to press the button to trigger the explosions <laughs> while taunting Dominic Toretta over the radio is so brilliant. And and they actually kind of throw you because they, they introduce the character and he's being the, the stiff muscle, the the guy who is, you know, you know, gonna be here for revenge. And then the next time you see him, it's like Hawaiian shirt and hi guys. Boom. <laughs> it's like what Jason Momoa's character is the Joker if the Joker were actually having fun. Yes. And it's this tension. He's, on the one hand, he's somebody who's, whose family and life has been taken away from him, and he blames Dom Toretto because it happened during the events of Fast and Furious 5. And at the same time, because he's lost everything thanks to Dom, he's got nothing to lose. So you're right, he's got this weird, giddy humor, and he's really taking enjoyment in figuring out bizarre and creative ways to torment and eventually take his revenge upon Dom. And, you know, he's a terrific villain. The movie is unbalanced because it's such a better villain than we have heroes. Yes. The heroes are so boring by comparison. They are. In some ways, it's because they always are using the same techniques. Yeah. And so there's something about the Fast and Furious franchise where because it is the Fast and Furious franchise, it always has to come back to cars. And that's good. That's good. Yeah. That is excellent. But it does mean that our characters default to that <laughs> yeah. in order to speed up the story. And that can have problems. And they even have uh, dialogue between the, the agency guy who's out, out to get Dom Toretto and, and Dom about the fact that you know, the days where one man behind the wheel of a car can make a difference are over. It really did seem like it was out of that Speed Racer movie. Oh, yeah. But it, it, at least it, it highlighted that tension in the movie. I just wish that Dom and the other characters were made more interesting in this movie to live up to that. Mm -hmm. challenge that tension dominic toretto family superpower yes if you are considered by dominic part of his family you inherit the power right and the power is if you are in physical contact with an operable motor vehicle you cannot be killed 
Boom. It explains so much. You fly off uh, a vehicle that's going 130 miles an hour and land on the hood of another vehicle that's going 90 miles in the other direction. That's okay. You will survive the impact because when you land, you are in contact with an operable motor vehicle. You use four (laughs) body-mounted rocket launchers to jump your vehicle in a stunt that feels exactly like the jump jacks from Speed Racer. (laughs) As long as it lands and it's still running, you're okay. This was part one of a two-parter. They made it very clear. This ends on a cliffhanger. So I am not sure. Oh, yes, very literally. They might have done something that breaks my theory, that breaks this theory of the uh, the Dom Toretto family superpower. But I'm not certain, so I'm going to wait till the the final movie before I really decide that. But I think the fascinating thing is that in terms of how the writing's gone... This is the, the the Dominic Toretto family superpower that has been building up over all these movies. This movie, Jason Momoa's character kind of has his own group superpower. Because I'm realizing during the footage, this guy has a contingency plan for everything. Yes. To an impossible degree. And so the, we can't die as long as our cars work run up against the, well, I've got a thousand ways to try to stop your cars, is kind of an interesting thing. It's the unstoppable, it's the immovable object versus the unstoppable force question colliding into each other, but with a whole lot of quips and explosions. It's impossible to get out of one of his traps without the response being, ha, you think you've gotten out of my (laughs) trap, but really that means I put you just where I want you. And that does kind of get old, but again, Dom, uh, uh, Jason Momoa sells that so well, it's fun to watch. It, the, it's the, I'm out. <laughs> oh, no. It's kind of a brilliant <laughs> cycle. <laughs> so this is a series where, you know, I, I might think it should have ended a while ago, but this movie was, I think, far better than 8 or 9. Yeah, I think so. It, it needs 8 and 9 because it uses plot points. Yeah. And it actually... The wildest cameo in the entire movie, I will tell you, is not a person. It is a set piece from a previous movie (laughs) that you do not expect to arrive when it does. This might end on a cliffhanger, but there is an end credit thing that implies they might continue more. They might take this in another direction. Yeah, we might get more than just one more Fast and Furious movie out of this franchise. Yeah, it just might not be more with Dominic Toretto and family. Right. And if they're going to sp- spend the time to set up a world this wild, I can understand not wanting to leave that sandbox for a while. But... Mm. So, of course, we will see the the second installment of this finale. And I'm really hoping that in some way they pull the plot back to stealing DVD players. Same! We need something <laughs> hidden in a DVD player. Yes. They need to steal. That yeah, needs there's, to be the ending. The critical data is on a, a DVD, so they, and nobody has a DVD player, so they have to go out and steal one in order to read that data. That, I, something like that. That would be so beautiful. Yeah. I'm hopeful. <laughs> the, you mentioned the pre-roll. The pre-roll in this was pretty good. The it pre-roll was... was it was what you might expect. Lots of bits from Fast and Furious movies. Lots of bits of from car action movies. and Initial D? Yes. The, a trailer for the live action version of Initial D. It was kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah. And it also included something that was kind of similar to what we saw for John Wick Chapter 4. Which yes. is 10 to 10. It was a 10 minutes, they put 10 minutes on the clock and occasionally paused it and gave us everything that had happened in the Fast and Furious franchise to get us ready for uh, for Fast 10 in 10 minutes. I think it might have been the same comedian I think it was. who did that terrific John Wick pre-show. And it was really good. And it that's was. what it's like. That's like, I saw this in the pre-show and then they did that in the movie. But honestly, I was, I very much appreciated that. That was a good setup. Yeah. If you, for some reason, had gone into Fast 10 without having seen any of the others, you at least would have a way to orient yourself. Oh, yeah. But yeah, being able to go from initial D to the, <laughs> to the retrospective to like a ludicrous music video. Kind yes. Of got you in the right mode. <laughs> that was fun. So a good pre-show. Food. We didn't have uh, dinner at the Alamo. We had had dinner before. So I had, I think, a strawberry shake and I had some popcorn. 
always good, of course. And I think you had a shake as well. I believe I had a, if I remember correctly, I had a strawberry shake as well, but I asked them to add a bit of chocolate syrup to it. Yeah. That was really good. I'm surprised that's not something they keep on their menu regularly. Just there's an option. A lot of things like that, if, especially if the theater is not too crowded, and this was kind of medium, yeah. half full, it was a late screening. The servers are usually pretty good about letting you customize things. If you're not trying to do it in the middle of the of the movie so that you've got to like explain yourself, but if you're ordering you know, during the pre-show before the feature starts and you want them to add chocolate syrup to your strawberry shake or you want your sandwich, but you want it on a different bun, there's a lot of combinations like that you can put together. And I've never had any pushback from, from staff. If it's something they can do, they always seem willing to do it. Yeah. So uh, it's always nice to uh, to have that interaction. So this was was a fun trip to the Alamo. I'm sure that in a year or so, we're going to be back at the Alamo for the next installment. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to be excited. I'd, I'd happily go to Sloan's Lake again. They were very fun about this. Yeah. I still think Sloan's Lake needs a refurbishment, but the staff and the location, all of that is still good. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for joining us for this Draft House Diary. Yeah, we'll be back for more. If you liked this, click that like button down below. And if you want more Draft House Diary entries, consider clicking that subscribe button and click the, uh, the bell notification button. But most important, we appreciate you being here. There'll be more Draft House Diaries soon. And in the meantime, enjoy your movies. And when you do, stay till the end of the credits. Why did you do that? I don't know. It's just <laughs> <your phone. laughs>